Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. would ask everyone here in-house to make that last check that cell phones have been turned off, a courtesy greatly appreciated by our panelists. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference following today's presentations. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel. All four presenters will make their remarks, and we will come back for a joint Q&A session following. First, we start with David Mulhausen, who is Research Fellow in Empirical Policy Analysis with Heritage's Center for Data Analysis. He is also an adjunct professor at George Mason University, teaching program evaluation and statistical methods. He is a leading expert on criminal justice programs. He has testified on issues such as parole, prisoner reentry, and the death penalty, and has even delved into voter registration issues. Prior to joining Heritage, he served on the staff of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Prior to that, he was a manager of the Juvenile Correctional Facility in Baltimore, Maryland. He holds a doctorate in public policy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and a bachelor's degree in political science and justice studies from Frostburg State University. He is also the author of Do Federal Social Programs Work? Our second panelist will be Peter Schruck. He is a Simon E. Baldwin Professor Emeritus of Law at Yale Law School, where he has held the chair since 1984. He has also served as Deputy Dean. His major fields of teaching and research are tort law, immigration citizenship and refugee law, group diversity and law, and administrative law. His most recent book is Why Government Fails So Often. Prior to joining Yale, he was Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the then U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Professor Schruck holds a B.A. from Cornell, a J.D. from Harvard Law School, an L.L.M. in International Law from NYU, and an M.A. in Government from Harvard. I assume everyone knows their alphabet. <laughs> Our third panelist will be Stuart Butler. Dr. Butler is Senior Fellow in Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. Prior to joining Brookings this past September, Dr. Butler ran Heritage's Center for Policy and in Innovation, and he previously served as Heritage's Vice President for Domestic and Economic Policy Studies. He is known for proposing innovative ideas such as enterprise zones and has also focused on health care policy and entitlement reform. He is a member of the panel of health advisors to the Congressional Budget Office, the Board of Health Services of the Institutes of Medicine, and the Editorial Board of Health Affairs. He holds degrees in physics, mathematics, as well as economics, and a doctorate in economic history, American economic history, all from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And joining us for the rest of the program will be John Barron, our fourth presenter is president of the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that he founded in 2001. The coalition's work with the executive branch and congressional policymakers has advanced important evidence-based reforms in U.S. social programs. Mr. Barron was twice nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate to serve on the National Board of Education Sciences and was the board's chair during his last term. He was also served on the he has also served on the National Academy's Committee Committee on Capitalizing on Science, Technology, and Innovation. He holds his law degree from Yale Law School, a master's in public affairs from Princeton, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Rice University. We will begin our presentations with David Malthausen. David. Before I start, I want to thank John Hillbop for introducing us and hosting this event. And my fellow panelists, Peter, Stewart, and John, who just arrived <laughs> on board. I was in standstill traffic, I apologize. Glad to have you here. Today's topic, oh, okay. today's topic about government failure and what to do about it dovetails nicely with my book, Do Federal Social Programs Work? Congress spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year on discretionary dis domestic social programs such as Head Start and numerous job training programs. For these social programs to be effective, they must improve social conditions such as poverty, poor academic achievement, low wages, and joblessness. 
<coughs> Head Start, the quintessential Great Society program, is a classic example of what a federal, federal social program does. As a, preschool, as a preschool program, Head Start was intended to give disadvantaged children an educational boost before entering elementary school. As the nation faces difficult choices over the federal government's spending, as demonstrated by our enormous debt, President Obama, along with many in Congress, are highly critical of any cuts to social programs and want to invest even more in these programs. In 2011, President Obama said, I firmly believe Head Start is an outstanding program and a critical investment. Remember the 2013 sequestration, the paltry automatic cross the board reduction in spending approved by Congress and the President? President Obama said, because of these reckless cuts, there are parents whose kids just got kicked out of Head Start scrambling for a solution. The President, like many other Many others simply assume that federal social programs are effective at making a difference in the lives of those participating in these <laughs> programs. Rather than making simplistic assumptions, the best way to determine whether federal social programs work is to rely on large-scale, multi-site experimental evaluations. And in my book, I relied on these rigorous evaluations to assess the effectiveness <laughs> of federal social programs. At the time when this manuscript was turned into the publisher, there were 20 evaluations of 21 social programs that have been published since 1990. Why did I use multi-site experimental evaluations to assess effectiveness? Simply put, these are the best studies for assessing whether or not a program works or not. They have higher internal validity, higher <coughs> external validity, than less rigorous designs. To have a high degree of internal validity, evaluations must demonstrate that the program in question had a causal impact. The outcome was intended, the causal impact on the outcome was intended to influence. This is the most rigorously, this is most rigorously achieved through random assignment, the gold standard for evaluations. Random assignment establishes equivalency between the control and treatment group because the assignment to either group is just based on random chance. You're not creaming the crop or picking individuals that you think are going to perform better or worse into different groups. As for external validity, the findings of multi-site experimental evaluations are reliable because they assess the performance of federal programs at multiple locations. While individual programs and single locations may be found to be effective, these small single-scale, single-site single evaluations do not inform federal policymakers about the overall effectiveness of national programs. The success of a single program, say a particular Head Start program operating in Baltimore, and it's, if it's found effective, does not tell you the op, how, the, how the national program, the average Head Start Center, is operating. You cannot make a generalization based on a small evaluation on whether or not these large-scale national programs are actually working. So that's why we need large-scale, multi-state evaluations that look at where the federal government is implementing these programs across the country and find out whether they work or not. Now, Unfortunately, these, these evaluations uh, demonstrate that federal social programs have a great difficulty in achieving their results. This assessment is not made lightly. It is based on the most scientifically rigorous evaluations of federal social programs that have been done. These programs are intended to address poverty, low academic achievement, unemployment, low wages, and a host of other problems. The rare exception is the National Evaluation of Welfare to Work Studies, or Strategies. This study found that welfare reform could yield successful results. Let's consider what the best scientific evidence says about Head Start. As we know, it's one of President Obama's favorite investments. Despite the program's long life and critical claim, a rigorous multi-site randomized evaluation called the Head Start Impact Study found that the initial yet meager beneficial effects of completing participation in the first school year of Head Start disappear when the student enters kindergarten. Head Start continues to have largely no effect on children when they reach the first and third grades. Overall, the evaluation found that the program largely failed to improve the cognitive, socio-emotional, health, and parenting outcomes of children who participated compared to the outcomes of similar children who did not participate. While the federal government 
has known that Head Start was a failure, Congress in recent years has increased funding for this failed program. While the Head Start Impact Study was producing disappointing results, the federal government tried to prove that a more intensive program could produce better results for Head Start. The result was the Head Start CARES demonstration. This demonstration uh, used random assignment to compare three, three more intensive early childhood education services to traditional Head Start services in 17 different locations. The results, just published in August, found some modest beneficial impacts at the end of the Head Start school year, just like the Head Start impact study. However, these effects disappeared by kindergarten, just like the Head Start impact study. Head Start is not alone as an investment with no return. The record of federal social programs is just as dreadful when it comes to helping minorities attend college, attempting to improve the behavior of the poor by moving them to the suburbs, helping the unemployed start their own businesses, and assisting workers gain skills that lead to higher incomes. Is lack of success in these endeavors the result of electing the wrong officials? No, I don't think so. It's too many Americans have an inflated sense of what the federal government can achieve. However, all federal social programs, or all federal programs are not failures. NASA's Apollo program was wonderfully successful. Uh, sending Americans safely to and from the moon was a singular achievement. Nevertheless, federal social programs intended to improve human behavior, like Head Start, have not produced similar mm. results. The reality is that social program advocates have, have an inflated sense of what the federal government can achieve when it comes to social engineering. In many ways, social engineering is a much more elusive human endeavor than building rockets. For too many federal, so or, for too many, too many federal social program advocates would have us believe otherwise, that these programs are effective. However, there is some hope. In September, Gallup released a poll that found that Americans believe that the federal government weighs 51 cents for every dollar it spends. Americans may be wiser than many politicians think. Yet, many politicians and social program advocates would have us believe that reducing funding for these programs, even minor reductions, will lead to disaster. If federal social programs do not work in the first place, then budget reductions for these, pro for these programs should not cause harm. This, this is good news for those of us worried about the federal debt and bad news for those of us that believe intentions are more important than results. Despite the best social engineering efforts, the evidence overwhelmingly indicates that these programs are largely ineffective. It cannot just be a coincidence that the findings of these 20 multi-site experimental evaluations all tend to conclude that federal social programs don't work. The American public should have nothing to fear from spending cuts to these programs. I conclude my comments. Well, first, I want to thank the uh, to Heritage for inviting me uh, to this splendid building. I had not seen it. Um, and also for convening this panel, which uh, addresses extraordinarily important topics. Uh, topics of policy effectiveness are often um, discussed in terms of sort of common sense. What sounds good, what kind of we would like it, like the world to be, what uh, uh, if people uh, uh, behave the way we would hope they would behave, um, these programs would be successful. And as David has indicated in his fine book, which unfortunately was not available to me when I wrote mine, um, he shows that this is simply uh, not the case. So my book um, nicely dovetails with David's, it, it, at least in terms of the uh, discussion here, in that I focus on the reasons why government fails so often. And by failure, I mean uh, the failure, and I define it in chapter two, I define what I mean by success and failure, and the criterion I use is, is a straightforward in principle, not easy to apply, but uh, it's the best we have, uh, cost-effectiveness. That is to say, if a program uh, generates fewer benefits than it costs, uh, it's a failure. And if it generates more uh, benefits than it costs, it's a success. That's a very minimal criterion. It's not a criterion that uh, would satisfy e everybody uh, except as a minimum. Uh, that is to say, if you can't pass the cost-effectiveness test, you shouldn't be uh, using taxpayers' 
money. If you do pass a cost effectiveness test, then maybe, maybe you should use the taxpayer's money. It would depend on other factors as well. So it's necessary but not, uh, not sufficient. And in my book, what I attempt to do is to uh, examine the structural, the deep structural, recurrent, endemic reasons why government fails so often. It doesn't always fail. And I have a chapter on successes, uh, but they are rather fewer and farther between than, you, than one might hope. Uh, some of them are very large programs, like Social Security and uh, food stamps, um, which is not to say that these programs couldn't be designed better than they have, and uh, Stuart Butler and others have suggested a variety of ways of informing, uh, uh, of reforming uh, Social Security. I, I don't happen to believe in privatization of Social Security, but uh, uh, a lot of smart people do. Um, but, uh, uh, but the fact is that um, uh, th these examples are relatively few and far between, as I said. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, um, I've identified a variety of syst systemic reasons and brought to bear uh, what the social science evidence on these uh, matters suggests. And it's a rather a dismal portrait of federal policymaking. I should say that my book confines itself to federal domestic policymaking. It doesn't examine uh, defense, military, national security, foreign affairs, uh, and, and so forth. I, I think I had a large enough task uh, simply looking across federal domestic programs. Nor does it uh, speak to state and local governments, although I have no doubt that uh, my findings and analysis uh, will uh, have a lot of applicability to state and local governments. But I make no strong uh, claims there. And I begin with the proposition that uh, the, gov the American uh, system is an extraordinarily successful social system, extraordinarily successful for hundreds of years and over a vast range of uh, human uh, efforts. Uh, and yet, as, uh, as David pointed out, the American public is greatly uh, disenchanted with the federal government. So on the one hand, you have pride in our society, a, a justified pride in our society's accomplishments over a wide range of uh, areas. And on the other hand, you have uh, disgust. Uh, I think that's not too strong a word. Disgust and growing disgust with the performance of government. Um, and so then I asked the question, well, why is that? Why, why would we find pride on the one hand and, and objective success, uh, and on the other hand find uh, uh, such disaffection? And I entertain a number of uh, uh, possible theories, but the one in which I uh, come to rest only because it's something that can be studied and uh, something that um, uh, we uh, can know a lot about is that People are disgusted with government because government doesn't perform well, just as they're disgusted with uh, their products and their services when they don't perform well. Uh, that seems to me to be uh, not only plausible but, uh, but, uh, but convincing. Whether there's a, a causal relationship, it's hard to say, but I think it's highly likely that there is a causal relationship. So um, uh, then I um, uh, discuss what the social science findings in general are about government effectiveness, and they're pretty dismal. Uh, I discuss Peter Rossi's uh, is a famous a sociologist, um, and I'll probably, I'm not going to take the time to try to find it in the book, but I, uh, he has developed uh, a number of uh, metallic laws of um, <coughs> policy evaluation, and uh, they're, uh, they're both amusing and extremely uh, telling. Here's, here's the iron law of evaluation. The expected value of any net impact assessment of any large-scale social, large social program is zero. The stainless steel law of evaluation. The better designed the impact assessment of a social program, the more likely is the resulting estimate of net impact to be zero. The brass law of evaluation. The more social programs are designed to change individuals, the more likely the net impact of the program will be zero. And the zinc law of evaluation is that only those programs that are likely to fail are evaluated. Uh, that's that's, uh, that's uh, fair enough, although um, I think that speaks more to the conclusions that such evaluations will reach rather than the impulse to, uh, to evaluate them. Head Start, as David uh, mentioned, and uh, which is uh, uh, carefully analyzed in his book, 
uh, is a great example of that. I suspect that uh, the program was uh, evaluated in part because uh, its sponsors thought that the evaluation would confirm uh, its uh, designers' fondest hopes, and it didn't. Um, so why evaluations are sponsored is, uh, is, uh, is not uh, altogether clear, but I think uh, it is the case that we tend to look at programs about which we have some initial doubts um, and, and, uh, and try to see what the, um, what the truth is about those uh, programs. So as I say, I, um, I uh, devote the great bulk of my book to uh, examining the, identifying and examining and testing against the data, uh, the structure, what I call the structural sources of policy failure. And um, uh, the, first, uh, the first group is incentives and collective irrationality. If we examine the incentives, not only of government actors, but of the uh, citizens who respond to the incentives that are created by uh, uh, many uh, government programs who find that uh, those incentives are perverse. Uh, the classic example, uh, and it's an example that runs across many uh, social programs as I show, is moral hazard, uh, where government creates uh, incentives through its programs, and often these are well-intended incentives, but sometimes uh, uh, Congress knows what, exactly what it's doing when it uh, designs these incentives into programs. Um, uh, the incentives uh, to individuals to behave in certain ways are inimical to the social welfare that one hopes the, uh, the program will uh, produce. So almost every insurance program that the government has set up, uh, probably with the exception of social, uh, uh, of, uh, social security because uh, people don't want to die earlier than, uh, they, than they would otherwise, but with regard to every, it has other problems, but that, I don't think it's a moral hazard problem. <laughs> Uh, but virtually every other program, uh, from uh, crop insurance to, uh, uh, to uh, flood uh, insurance to the federal pension guarantee uh, program uh, to health insurance to many others, uh, create a variety of incentives that, uh, if responded to by rational individuals, will lead to bad results. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which uh, went into effect uh, just as my book was going to, uh, to press, uh, is replete with such uh, perverse incentives. Um, how they will work out uh, is, I think, still uh, uh, an open question. I'm agnostic about it. I, I, I have uh, serious misgivings about what the consequences of these incentives will be, but uh, we'll see. For just for example, is, uh, the program uh, sets up a threshold for uh, the mandatory uh, 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 coverage uh, at a level of uh, I think it's it's 30 uh, hours of work per week. So employers have an incentive to reduce uh, the uh, the workers' uh, hours to below 30. That's not that's not good, uh, but uh, rational employers uh, will. Other things being equal, uh, move in that direction, and there are countless other other uh, <coughs> examples. Um, a collective irrationality is the problem that occurs when uh, perfectly rational people uh, uh, make individually rational decisions, but uh, when they are collectivized in a public policy, uh, it produces perverse uh, results. Moral hazard is just one example of that, and I have uh, many other uh, mechanisms as well. Uh, then there's information. The government has very poor information on about the underlying social conditions and dynamics that need to be understood in order to uh, uh, for a program to succeed, even its in its own terms. Why does the government have poor access to information? Well, politics distorts some of that information. Uh, government is very slow to obtain information. The way in which the information is processed is uh, is uh, relatively clumsy. Uh, there are political distortions uh, all, all the way, um, and uh, and so we uh, and Congress often decides to designs programs in this way. So, for example, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives is statutorily prohibited from gathering the kind of information and 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 uh, analyzing that information in ways that would enable uh, the uh, agency to uh, to do its work. Congress didn't want them to do. Their work now again, especially at a libertarian uh, uh, organization, 
uh, it's perfectly legitimate to ask the question, well, should, should uh, they be doing that work in the first place? My point is not to argue that, but rather to say that uh, Congress has disabled uh, the agency from doing what it uh, purports to do, and that's, uh, that's true of many, many uh, information programs in government. The rollout of Obamacare uh, is uh, the, 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 the uh, um, incredible uh, failure of the exchanges, notwithstanding the fact that this was the President's signature program, will define his legacy, and notwithstanding the fact that uh, a lot of money was being thrown at it, uh, is, is another <coughs> example of this. Um, uh, inflexibility, another feature of government, and, and an endemic one, because uh, government is uh, very large. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge battleship that can't turn on a dime, even though social conditions are changing uh, constantly. Um, and it's inflexible for other reasons. Uh, the status quo uh, has a very firm grip on uh, government uh, programs because of the politics surrounding it, and also because of the difficulty of uh, uh, creating incentives to, uh, uh, to uh, change. Uh, I also talk about incredibility of government policy. Um, uh, nudge me if I'm... Oh, okay. 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 Uh, <laughs> the inc incredibility, by which I mean uh, the inability of government to render its policies credible in the long run. That is to say, regardless of the quality of the policy, regardless of the substantive content, the government can't guarantee that the policy environment is going, and therefore the policy, is going to be the same five years from now, or indeed after the next election, uh, and therefore the, the interests, the state and local implementers, the private sector, the markets, and, and uh, NGOs that need to work t to, in order to help the program achieve its objectives uh, can't count on the government uh, doing that, so they don't invest. Uh, in that environment of uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty imposes enormous costs, and the government can't reduce that uncertainty because it is supposed to be de democratically accountable, and therefore uh, it can't, uh, it can't uh, establish its programs on a firm footing. The market, in, in sharp contrast, the market uh, has devised a number of different ways in which a, a, a market actor can enhance its credibility. It can post bonds, it can factor the uncertainty level into the price that it uh, pays or, 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 or that it demands from uh, other actors in the market, uh, and in a variety of ways can price the risk that things will change in the future. The government can't, uh, can't do that. Um, implementation is a, I devote a, a long chapter to this because it's also a chapter in which I summarize a lot of the social science evidence on how gov government programs actually uh, perform. And uh, implementation is a black box uh, to the vast majority of uh, people who even think about government. Uh, fortunately, there are a few political scientists who have examined in a systematic way the nature of implement the implementation challenge and what happens. So uh, uh, Aaron Wildowski and uh, Jeffrey Pressman wrote a wonderful book, which I would urge all of you to read if you haven't uh, already, uh, with a wonderful title and uh, subtitle of Implementation. How Great Expectations in Washington Are Dashed in Oakland, or Why It's Amazing That Federal Programs Work at All, this being a saga of the Economic Development Administration as told by two sympathetic observers who seek to build morals on a foundation of ruined hopes. Uh, then I have a chapter on the limits of law, and by this I mean not the limits of one or another specific law, but rather what the inherent characteristics of law, any time you use it, uh, are and the implications of those limits on the coherence and effectiveness of policy. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, there's no escape from law uh, in policy making. The only uh, non-legal mechanism of policy making I think of is jawboning, which presidents have sometimes done. But other than that, uh, their uh, policy uh, instruments are one or another form of law. And with law, you get a whole series of entailed uh, characteristics, uh, uh, which I discuss in, in, in some detail. Then I have a chapter on the bureaucracy, which is uh, a very, in a very serious uh, disrepair. Uh, the federal bureaucracy has uh, suffered uh, serious losses in terms of its prestige, in terms of its uh, capacity to attract uh, good people, and in terms of its capacity to retain 
uh, good, uh, good managers, its capacity to discipline uh, incompetence or, uh, or even illegality. Um, uh, and uh, in a variety of ways that I explain, the, the bureaucracy is really uh, foundering. And uh, whether you agree with gov what government, do government is doing or not, uh, it, unless you believe the government should be doing nothing, it's important that those who actually implement policies be competent uh, and, and effective. And that's much more of a problem today than it was uh, many years ago. I've indicated that I, meant, uh, I have a chapter on policy successes, and then uh, I have a long chapter on uh, possible remedies uh, to the, uh, to the uh, disabilities that I've uh, analyzed in, in the book. And uh, it's a long chapter. I, uh, if, if you're interested uh, uh, in the q and A, I'll, uh, I'll talk about some of those. But what I do is to uh, organize the analysis of, of remedies according to the, these uh, structural sources of failure that I, uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier. So I probably have exceeded my time, uh, but I'm look forward to, looking forward to the Q&A uh, later on. Good. Um, it's a great pleasure to be on this uh, panel. This is actually the first uh, panel I've taken part on, or formal gathering here at Heritage since I moved to the dark side uh, at, at Brookings, according to some people. But, uh, but my views have not changed. Uh, and. Uh, so I bring greetings from uh, the other end of Massachusetts Avenue. Um, but my interest uh, uh, generally has been the last few years on looking at uh, how institutions function and also how the process of innovation occurs. Uh, not only what, how ideas develop, but, but how they spread. And, and so when I kind of look at the issue of, of, of government's uh, programs and the, the track record of those, and particularly the replication of those, programs. That's been of, of particular interest to me. And David and I wrote a piece earlier this year for National Affairs, which you can find either on the Heritage site or the National Affairs site, um, which was uh, entitled, Can Government Replicate Success? Query. Um, and uh, it, in many ways, we weren't only looking at government, but also at, at the area of private philanthropy, of how big institutions try to fund uh, the replication of, of, of ideas. And so, it, it, in looking at this, we, we tried to look at why this happens, and, and some of it has been said, so I'll just make that very, very brief. Uh, and then what to do about it? How do you think differently about the process of replication given all the shortcomings? And I think when you look at, at, uh, at, the, at the issue of replicating uh, something that seems successful, uh, you immediately face uh, a number of challenges. Uh, which we talk about and, and have been mentioned by others already uh, on the panel. In some cases, there's a failure to even examine why something is successful or if it is successful. So the very premise that it's successful may be open to challenge uh, anyway. You have the issue, particularly in social uh, programs, of what we call causal density, that there could be, there are many things going on. It's not a sterile laboratory, or as I would say from England, laboratory. Uh, for, for examining things. So, yeah, even if it's successful on, on, in, in a sense of a, an obvious way, it's not obvious at all necessarily why it's successful. And even if you go and ask people there, why is it successful? Even they are not necessarily the best placed person to know why something is successful. You see this a lot when you go talk to, uh, say, Jeffrey Canada at the Harlem Children's Zone or something. He'll tell you why it's successful, but we don't necessarily know that, and he doesn't necessarily know whether that's the case. So there are technical reasons why it is difficult to know whether something is successful and what are the elements of it that you'd want to reproduce somewhere else. That's a general problem. It doesn't matter whether the Ford Foundation is funding it or the Department of Health and Human Services. Secondly, there, are, uh, there is a political challenge which has been uh, mentioned particularly by, by Peter. Um, if you've got a flow of money coming to a program or to fund a program, evaluation is not necessarily something you want to encourage. Better to have the flow of money come, because you know it works. And those evaluators may get it wrong, so you don't want to kind of do that. So there's a reason why uh, there's a resistance to evaluation uh, in that way. And those even that are in charge of programs, and I think Peter will uh, agree to this, is there's a tendency within a bureaucracy of a large foundation or a, a government agency to say, well, if I want to be evaluated as the person overseeing this program, I'd rather just make sure boxes are checked. Uh, 
then something is really looked at. If they did it the right way, we sent out the RFP, they were supposed to do it, and they did all that, uh, I'm, less, I'm more concerned about that because that can appear in my job evaluation. Whereas a, a sense of whether it's successful is a much murkier thing and, and maybe... So there's a tendency, and I would call it the political reason, to, to be resistant and discouraging of evaluation. And then there's also what you might call the, si the situational or human nature aspect of, of trying to replicate. Uh, uh, one of the procedures we often use to try to um, replicate or examine uh, how programs should work is a pilot program or a demonstration program. Uh, one of the things about that, it's a little bit like the intensive care unit in a hospital. Everybody's committed and focused on this person. Well, in a, in a pilot program, as opposed to the general ward or the general uh, parts of the hospital, in a pilot program, the people are, well, uh, are highly trained in what they're trying to do, the money is usually available, and so on. You then start to replicate it somewhere else, and you don't necessarily have the same commitment, understanding, training, and therefore it becomes more difficult. That's why you can see cases where something like uh, in Head Start, you may well have, in some early cases, great success, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to get the, the human assets in place to, to reproduce it um, effectively later on. It's also, of course, a tendency, if you think a pilot works, to assume it'll work everywhere. And you I think, referred to that. How does it work in Oakland? So because of causal density, because of so many things going on, it doesn't follow that something that appears, and even it's been evaluated to work in a particular place, will work. You would want to have some variation, adaptability, if you really wanted to work. But the very design of the program and the funding and the way the government looks at it and the way the bureaucrat checking his boxes or her boxes is going to discourage that. Uh, and, 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 and finally, there's a tendency on the ground in Oakland to say, okay, well, if, if getting the money means we do it this, have to do it this way to check the boxes, even though we actually think we should adapt it and do it in this other way, we may, our funding may be at risk. So even with the best will in the world, there's a tendency for people on the ground to say to, to revert to the checklist rather than actually using their best judgment about how to put into place a particular um, uh, approach. So in other words, when you look at the idea of replication of, of something which, as I say, appears to be successful, it's not a simple issue as to how you would get that to happen. So how would you move forward on how, what would be a better way of thinking about um, taking those government programs uh, or, or those private programs that seem to work in a particular place and reproduce them better. It seems to me that a better way of approaching, and which is what David and I kind of develop, is the idea of what we call evolutionary um, replication. And by that I mean that the idea of saying, rather than try to figure out an ideal approach, uh, something that, quote, works in a pilot situation, and then get everybody to copy it, what I would call the silver bullet m model. You know, this works, so let's try to get it to work everywhere else and get it and force everything else. You, you, you would instead say, what are the essential themes that seem to be working? And let's replicate that and allow a wide range of, it, of, of ways of doing that, setting a goal and a standard and a theme. So, for example, you might say something like, um, maybe um, schools or school reform works better if parents are more in control of the dollars. Some people argue this here at Heritage and elsewhere, even at Brookings, some people do this, argue that. And, and, and so, so, you know, vouchers or something like that. But the way you implement it could be quite different in different places. So, and, and things would look different, but the common theme is there. So it's the idea of replication that says, we don't have a magic bullet, we have a theme that seems to work. Let's allow maximum variation. <coughs> and if time permitted, we could talk about the healthcare case as a good example of that, where, where the idea of getting the precision and getting it looking the same actually undermined a lot of possibility to make something work by allowing a degree of, vari uh, of variation. You can look at other areas like early childhood education uh, and so on in, in exactly the same way. And you'd want to allow uh, local adaptation innovation in that case, so that the Oakland dimension would be 
would be a, a, a part of whatever it was that you thought worked in somewhere else. But the Oakland dimension would be there. Uh, you'd want to do it in, a, in a, essentially a, a delegation model of saying, we're going to, in fact, to allow a lot of experimentation at that local level. So what does that require, just to end on, in terms of how you, in terms of designing a replication process in that? Well, number one, I would suggest that it leads you to think of a, particularly with government programs, to think of some general ap approach of what I would call a waiver strategy. To say, okay, this is what we think works, but, and these are the objectives that we have in, we being government, uh, uh, and, and the outcomes. If you've got a pl a, a, an alternative plausible way that you're willing to see measured, to see if you can accomplish the same objectives in the same general manner, good, you know, go ahead. Uh, use the money differently, do things a little differently around that common theme with the common objectives. But we want, to, we want it to be looked at. We want to see what we can learn uh, from that. Uh, so that would be, that would be as opposed to the replication of the, magic, of the silver bullet model or the demonstration model. You'd want to look differently at information. One of the things about c c evolution and continuous adaptation is you, you, you have to make decisions based on information which is imperfect or from a different source from the large-scale evaluation. I've worked a lot in long-term care area and to some extent in the early childhood area. And you say to I say to experts, well, what, if we wanted to do a, a full evaluation of, the, of this particular idea about, say, long-term care, how long would it take to do that? And people would say, well, you know, by the time you've done that, by the time you've figured it all out and you've tracked people through a certain period, maybe 30 years uh, would, would be about right for an, a full understanding. Well, in an evolutionary process, you don't kind of hang around for 30 years. You've got to have other ways of guiding change and that's where this sort of horizontal information is so important to understand and how we actually make decisions and modify it. Markets work like this all the time. There is no central information system in a market economy. It is constant um, perception information. It's a, it's a horizontal. Think about Amazon. Think about when you go on and say, which book should I read on Amazon? Uh, you look at other people. You look at, you look at this sort of crowdsource sort of model. Think about when, you, if you go to a new school and you want your child to get a good teacher, how do you find out who is a good teacher? Do you go on and look at uh, analysis of, uh, you know, double-blind studies about a particular teacher? No. What do you do? You ask other parents. And you ask parents who are more like you, have the same kind of situation, and that's a very effective way of making decisions. Well, it has a parallel in thinking about uh, replication. You want to have th this information flows in a horizontal basis as best as possible. And you set up systems to do that of information. Every so often, of course, when you start seeing patterns develop, you want to do exactly the kind of studies that David and Peter have, have emphasized of doing a full evaluation. That allows big, big changes of stages to be seen <coughs> and to guide uh, future development. And we, we, we sometimes find even things we thought worked in an evolutionary sense are not as good as we thought, or, 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 or maybe come up with different. So, the, so it's very important to think of information as being this dual process of horizontal, informal information to guide adaptability, and then periodic real evaluations as best as we can do them to see if these are milestones, benchmarks that we can use. I think if we start to go in that direction and think about, about reproduction of uh, replication of programs in that way, we would be more likely to have a panel here in a few years that talks, that, that talks about the success of government programs or the success of, of, of private programs because we would appreciate the kinds of things that we've been hearing from the other panelists and how institutionally you have to adapt to those lessons in order to envision a different form of, of, of constant adaptation as a way of reproducing of good ideas. John? Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the Heritage Foundation for inviting me to speak on the panel, and David in particular. Um, our organization, the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. <coughs> our mission, in a sentence, is to try to increase the effectiveness of government through the use of rigorous evidence about what works, 
We've worked closely with both the Bush administration and the Obama administration, uh, and a number of the evidence-based concepts that we've advanced have been enacted into law and policy, as I'll discuss at the end of my remarks, some of the initiatives I'll discuss at the end of my remarks. And we've no, uh, we're not affiliated with any programs. Uh, we've no financial interest in any of the policy ideas that we support. So I think, turning to the uh, subject of this panel, I think that any objective uh, observer um, who has looked at the body of rigorous, randomized studies of social programs would agree that many do not work, and of those found effective in a single site or uh, study, many of those positive findings are not replicated in subsequent trials. The first point I'd hope to convey in my remarks is that this pattern is not unique to social policy. Uh, in, in business, for example, Jim Manzi reports in his new book, Uncontrolled, that Google and Microsoft have conducted 13,000 randomized controlled trials of different business strategies and products in the past few years, and 80 to 90 percent of those have found no, st no significant effects. In Manzi's words, quote, innovative ideas rarely work. In medicine, uh, there have been reviews in four different areas, fields of medicine, that have found that 50 to 80 percent of the promising findings uh, in phase two studies, which are usually small randomized trials or match comparison group studies, are reversed. They're overturned when a larger, more definitive randomized trial is done in phase three, which is required for FDA licensing. So that's a case where you already have promising evidence from an initial trial, an e a tightly controlled efficacy mm -hmm. trial. Uh, the majority of those do not replicate. Uh, so turning back to social spending and education policy, since I, the Institute of Education Sciences was established at the Department of Education in 2002, it has sponsored large, convincing, randomized trials of approximately 90 different educational interventions, everything ranging from teacher training programs to commercially developed software for teaching reading and math to school choice programs and so on, different curricula. Close to 90 percent of those have found weak or no positive effects for the intervention that was being evaluated compared to what schools were doing anyway. And that was true even for a sizable number of programs that everybody had thought of as evidence-based based on the prior, uh, prior, more preliminary studies. So the pattern of frequent null findings and unsuccessful replication trials occurs in many different fields where rigorous studies are carried out. And if I have time, maybe in the discussion, I'd, I'd like to share what I believe is a common dynamic across different fields that causes the, explains the high replication failure. But the second main point that I hope to convey um, in my remarks is that there are very important examples of successful replications in each of these fields. In medicine, for the past 50 years, the FDA has required a demonstration of effectiveness um, in, for, before it licenses a new drug or pharmaceutical uh, device. In two well-conducted randomized controlled trials, meaning there has to be a replication before the drug gets marketed. Findings from those trials have dramatically improved life and health uh, in the United States. Uh, for example, those trials have definitively established the effectiveness of vaccines for measles and hepatitis B, of treatments for high blood pressure and high cholesterol, which have helped bring about a reduction by more than 50 percent in uh, coronary heart disease and stroke since the 1960s, uh, of cancer treatments that have dramatically improved survival rates from leukemia, <coughs> Hodgkin's disease, breast cancer, and many other cancers. Similarly, in social policy, there are important examples of successful replications. In Welfare to Work, the California GAIN randomized trial in the early 1990s found very large impacts for Riverside, California's Welfare to Work program. It was a work-focused program, and it was found over a five-year period to produce roughly a 40 percent increase in workers' and participants' employment and earnings. 
um, for single parent long-term welfare recipients, which was astonishing, and people thought, can you replicate that? Which is an important question. Um, that same trial found that Los Angeles Welfare to Work program, which emphasized providing welfare recipients with basic education, produced very weak effects. So Los Angeles, in response to those findings, scrapped its program. Uh, they adopted a work-first strategy modeled largely, largely on Riverside. When tested in a subsequent randomized controlled trial, the LA uh, Job First Gain program, that's what it was called, was found to produce a 25% increase in employment and earnings, not quite as big as Riverside, but still really impressive. Other examples of successful replications in social policy include life skills training, which is a low cost, uh, $20 per student, um, middle school substance abuse prevention program, which has been shown in two well-conducted randomized trials, large trials carried out by independent research teams, um, to produce uh, a 20% reduction in smoking <coughs> initiation and a 10 to 15% reduction, reduction in drunkenness uh, by the time of high school graduation, five years after the program has been administered. Um, the Nurse Family Partnership is a nurse home visitation program for first-time low-income mothers. It's been found highly effective in three different well-conducted randomized trials carried out in different decades, different populations. The replicated effects include reductions in child abuse, neglect, and hospitalizations of 20 to 50 percent. And for children of the most at-risk mothers, uh, sizable improvements in their cognitive and educational outcomes, such as an 8% increase in their GPA, the children's GPA, through elementary school. Fi as a final example, a different area, the Carrera Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program uh, has been evaluated in a large multi-site randomized controlled trial um, and was found by independent evaluators, independent of the program, and was found to produce uh, 40 to 50 percent reductions in girls' pregnancies and births as of age 17. Importantly, those large effects were replicated across both the six New York City sites and the six uh, Carrera sites located elsewhere in the country or uh, across the United States. Um, so there are successful examples of uh, examples of successful replication in different areas. Um, so here's the question I want to pose and then try to answer, uh, which is that in both medicine and social spending, only a small fraction of the rigorously tested interventions are found to produce meaningful effects. And yet in medicine, we've seen amazing progress over the past few decades in improving life and health. In social policy, we've seen progress in some areas, like reducing teen pregnancy and violent crime. But in key areas, like um, reducing poverty, improving K-12 education, there's been little or no progress for a very long time. Why the difference? A key factor, I'd suggest, is that in medicine, the system is set up to reward evidence of effectiveness. The FDA, as I mentioned, specifically requires two randomized trials showing clinically meaningful effects before licensing a drug or uh, medical device for market, which creates an enormous incentive for the development of strong experimental evidence, the replication of the strong experimental evidence, and it also provides the mechanism, once you have a proven replicated therapy, to put it into widespread use. By contrast, for most large social programs of the kind that David uh, and others were talking about, Head Start, Title I at the Department of Education, the Workforce Investment Act, evidence plays very little role in how funds in those programs get allocated. Those, fund, those programs are basically set up as large faucets. Congress has told the, fe the federal agencies to allocate large streams of funding to state and local organizations. Um, uh, and it, the funding is allocated uh, often by formula, sometimes through competition. But evidence about which, pro, which state and local activities are effective or not effective plays almost no role in what gets funded. So activities with strong replicated evidence of large effects, like life skills training and career, may never receive funding under these federal 
uh, funding streams and never expand. The promising news is that in a few recent instances, Congress has, has enacted um, what are called tiered evidence programs, and it's an idea that actually had its origins in the Bush administration, but uh, uh, has been expanded more widely under the Obama administration. Um, an example, just to be without going into details, is the Investing in Innovation Fund at the Department of Education, um, where in its, the top tier, the largest grants in that program are made uh, to K-12 interventions that have strong evidence of effectiveness to scale them up. And when they're scaled up, there's a requirement for a rigorous randomized evaluation to see whether they're still effective at scale. So an example of an intervention being scaled up under the I-3 program is Success for All, which is a school-wide uh, uh, school uh, reform program for high-poverty schools that's been shown over a three-year period in a multi-site randomized trial to improve reading achievement by about 25 to 30 percent of the grade level. Um, so that's being scaled up, and there actually ha is a, a replication trial of that program and the other scale-up programs that's ongoing, and the initial <coughs> results they're actually are fairly positive. They're early, but uh, quite encouraging that, that these evidence-based programs are uh, replicating. Um, the program also, the I3 program also funds a lot of promising programs that are backed by more <coughs> moderate evidence. They get smaller grants, but they're also a requirement for a rigorous evaluation. The idea there is to stimulate innovation and help to grow the number of proven models, because right now there are very few. So my thought, uh, in conclusion, is that Congress and uh, policymakers in general <coughs> could fundamentally shift the social spending landscape by incorporating similar evidence-based funding criteria into billion-dollar federal programs, including entitlement programs, through mechanisms such as that which uh, Stewart has discussed um, and others, other mechanisms like uh, waivers, which Stewart mentioned, but there are other mechanisms as well. Um, those sort of uh, criteria for uh, requirements for building evidence and criteria for um, uh, before a program is scaled up require strong evidence. Um, embedding that concept into social spending would create a powerful incentive similar to that in medicine for the development, rigorous evaluation, and if effective, dissemination of new program models and strategies. It would essentially incorporate an evidence-driven dynamic into an otherwise moribund system of social spending. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We will have a microphone, and we'll pass it for the question and answer session. Uh, do you have any individual comments on each other's remarks before we start? I, I see people words. squibbling all there. Yeah, uh, I, should I start? I have a few very, uh, very brief ones. Um, one is that the excellent book that uh, John presumably knows, um, but the rest of you may not know, is a book by Judith Guerin and Howard Ralston called The Struggle for Evidence. I think that's the, I think that's the title. In which Judith Guerin, who was the head of the major, a, a major organization that uh, tested uh, the efficacy of social programs, the Manpower Development Research Corporation, I think it's called, started with job training programs, but, but branched out, uh, recounts uh, how she ha attempted, or organization attempted, to um, institutionalize uh, the sort of uh, evidence-based uh, testing of social programs on a much uh, broader scale and the, and the difficulty of doing that. Uh, it's, it's a very, very enlightening book. Um, the Struggle for Evidence, I believe, is the title of it. Um, uh, secondly, um, a very good example of uh, a, a pro program on, that was not on John's list. And there are obviously many are not on his list because he was limited in time. But uh, you may know that Carolyn Hoxby, who is an re education researcher at Harvard and now at Stanford, um, has done research showing that a very, very inexpensive improve, in, increase in the information that's made available to high-performing but low-income and uh, uh, students who are not college bound in the absence of this intervention makes a huge difference in uh, inducing them to uh, uh, go to college. These, if colleges know about them, they're going to want to 
uh, in many cases, of course, they, they need scholarship aid, but um, they're going to want to recruit these students. And I believe the amount uh, that uh, per student uh, that is involved here is something like $20. It's extremely low expenditure on the part of the government to improve uh, uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of outcome. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, Stuart mentioned uh, something about checking boxes. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this reminds me of the electronic medical records program that the Bush administration poured a tremendous amount of money into, and Obama <laughs> has uh, as well, uh, which uh, uh, in encourages and to some extent requires physicians to, uh, uh, to uh, keep medical records that can then be readily accessible digitally. And it turns out, I have some discussion in my book of this, it turns out that um, one of the unforeseen consequences is that, and many physicians have reported this to me anecdotally as well, is that they kind of check boxes uh, automatically rather than spending uh, as much, and lots of boxes, there are lots of boxes that have to be filled out, rather than spending time with their patients. Indeed, they tend to turn their backs on their patients so that they can do the paperwork that's necessary to comply with these. <laughs> What's that? They do it on screen, so they yeah. don't look at the pair. Um, <laughs> so even things that seem self-evidently right. desirable often aren't. Common sense is, as I said at the outset, is a very, very poor guide to policy uh, uh, design. And most, as <coughs> Stuart uh, and John uh, said, most new ideas are bad ideas. Uh, this is not a this is not a uh, hidebound uh, observation. It's just. It's just true. The vast majority of new ideas are bad ideas. So there's all this invocation, and especially at Yale Law School, where I taught and apparently uh, John attended, it's all this talk about creativity and you know, new thinking and so forth. That's great as long as we recognize that most of it's going to be very <coughs> ill uh, designed. I'm just going to write down ill-designed ideas from Yale. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one very quick point. That's appropriate it. for a Brookings institution <coughs> person, right? Well, I paid a lot for my kids to Yale, so I'm sensitive <laughs> to this. But I just wanted to say one quick thing about what John said with regard to this, I'm not sure you call it a paradox, but, but the difference between what goes on in, in drug development and the, and, and the very high success in terms of public effects, public health mm -hmm. and so on, and, and other areas. I think it's very important kind of looking at that from the economic point of view, that in, in the drug development area, you have patents, which basically means that you have the right to maximize rents returned from a, a particular product. And the FDA approval means if somebody else doesn't have that, it is illegal for them to compete with you. So I think when you look at the, at the payoff possibility of accepting the idea of rigorous evaluation, in the drug development area, there's a very high economic value for going down that route and encouraging. Indeed, drug companies uh, actually pay for um, significant parts of, of the, you know, the cost of doing evaluate because it's in their interest. When you look at other program areas like helping, you know, inner city kids learn better, there's a, the economics of it is so totally different that I think you get a very different get different pattern in that than you would get in the in the in the drug field, precisely because of the economic constraints and economic incentives involved. Well, if I may, one, one comment on t uh, Stuart's last uh, observation <laughs> is what, what that reveals, uh, though he didn't quite say it, is that there's a, there's a trade-off, a poignant trade-off in terms of demanding rigorous evidence Absolutely. of the efficacy. Totally agree with in that. the case of FDA, uh, it costs uh, uh, in excess of a billion dollars to, dr to develop a major drug. Uh, some drugs are simply not, that would be very useful, are simply not developed or not developed or marketed soon enough because of that high cost. So it's a question of finding the optimal level of, uh, of evidence uh, uh, and not simply evidence versus ignorance. Um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, both of those remarks. I think um, uh, one of the things that's, um, it, it is, I think, sort of without question that, you know, the FDA mechanism as imperfect as it may be, has, um, has produced an, some enormous successes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, it's statins are in widespread use, death rates have come down for our, you know, uh, the leading killer in the United States, which, which is coronary heart disease, by an enormous amount. People used to drop dead of uh, heart attacks at a much uh, younger age uh, than they do now. Um, President Roosevelt died of uh, 
a stroke caused by malignant hypertension, and that's an easily treatable uh, condition today. Um, so now, it's important to recognize that the, the use of rigorous evidence uh, in medicine is a relatively new phenomenon. And it came about uh, because the NIH started funding a few randomized trials, the VA, et cetera, in the 1950s and 60s. But up until about 19, the early 1960s, the use of rigorous impact evaluations, randomized trials, was very rare uh, in medicine. What changed was when Congress passed the 1962 amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and said you had to have adequate and well-controlled trials before a new drug could be marketed. And that was a turning point. And that's, that FDA marketing mechanism was, uh, was I think, the, the big change in what, ha what has happened since that time. The number of randomized trials done in the United States has jumped from 100 a year in the mid-1960s to more than 10,000 a year uh, going on at any particular time uh, when it was measured again in the late 1990s. And that market me mechanism has caused um, uh, this huge investment in the development and uh, uh, dissemination of new drugs. Um, I'm not saying that the same thing exactly could be done in social policy, but one could imagine, and it's been done in these tiered evidence initiatives, it could be done much more widely, that before money is given out to a school district or a state and local agency, that there is a requirement either to participate in a rigorous evaluation if they're doing something new and innovative, to give them a waiver from federal law to allow them to do something innovative, coupled with a requirement for a rigorous evaluation to see whether it's working, or to give them a strong incentive to implement a program that already has strong replicated evidence of effectiveness. In that way, in, in many ways, you could replicate some of the key incentives that, dri that have been driving all the success in, in medicine over the past half century. Let's see if we have something from the audience. Mm -hmm. Question? I'll be glad to recognize anyone who wants to discuss. Oh, sorry. Adam, all the way over. Just a moment, Bill. I'll repeat it. Speak loudly. <laughs> Thank you. Randomized tests are obviously desirable, and we should do a lot of them. But don't you see a tendency, when you get a positive test, for the funding <laughs> to go up, but when you get a negative test, for nothing to happen? Uh, it, 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 it seems like that, that we're not talking about something we should be talking about. Uh, the tests alone are not sufficient to bring about the policy change. Uh, it, it's, I've been thinking more and more about a pay-go that has to, to, uh, to accompany that. You know, if you want to increase funding because a program is effective, you must decrease funding in a program that has been proved ineffective. Uh, it, it, this is so important, it, and, and I'll just conclude on this one point. We don't have any money on Capitol Hill. We're completely bankrupt. Um, and, and yet, uh, good programs get additional funding, and bad programs get additional funding. Uh, despite the evidence, which is arrayed in David's book and, and, in, and in Peter's book, despite the best intentions of people to actually follow that evidence, there is another factor, an institutional bias, to keep funding in place. David? Well, thanks, Bill. Speak I, up, David. I, I think that the, one of the problems is, is that we have special interest groups go up around social programs and they protect them, even if they do fail. Uh, you look at Head Start, well, head, federal funding goes to Head Start centers, and the Head Start centers go send funding to the head, National Head Start Association, which, which, which lobbies the Hill and says, if you touch this program, you're going to die politically. Uh, so I think there's really a lack of effort to <coughs> cut programs that don't work. I, I've gone to conferences in D.C. by groups that are saying we need to have performance measurement, we need to have results that matter, and the list of speakers go on and on about new spending. They don't mention one program that should be cut. 
And it, I find it just amazing sort of the evidence-based community is so focused on spending more money and they're totally silent on actually cutting the programs that don't work. Um, I uh, go to page 398 of my book and you'll see there's a, <laughs> there's a discussion of PAYGO and an endorsement of, uh, of that and, and, a, and a brief history of the, of the uh, PAYGO efforts. But uh, so I completely agree with that. But in the end, you know, your bosses are going to have to make the hard decisions. When we produce the evidence, uh, you know, the people with power have to uh, have the courage to stand up to the interests and, and make them. So uh, go back to the Hill and tell them that. So I, I would just say I think there may be a different way on that. Um, I agree entirely that there's the institutional bias, even if a program has been shown ineffective for it to continue ad infinitum. Um, there was an evaluation, it's in David's book, uh, of the 21st Century Community Learning Centers, which is a big after-school program, a billion-dollar program started in the late 90s, that not only found no effects, but as David has pointed out, there were adverse effects on behavior. Uh, President Bush proposed in his budget, uh, one of his early budgets, to cut the program by 40%. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, before he was governor, came in and to testify before Congress, how can you cut funding for these after-school programs? The appropriations committees put all the money back. There was no cut to the program, and it continues to this day. Uh, I think it's very difficult to change that dynamic, so I, I, I suggest there's a different way forward. Um, program, most federal programs like that, like 21st Century, fund a vast diversity of interventions. Uh, after school programs that are focused on recreation, focused on one on one tutoring, focused on homework, and so on. There are a lot of different specific strategies that are used. Um, there may be a few strategies in there that are highly effective, and, and many, many strategies probably, you know, the 90% probably don't work uh, if they were rigorously evaluated. And that's why the average program effect is uh, close to zero. Um, what one could do within that program. Is, not for con is, is for Congress to set up that program so that the, the criteria in the grant making uh, embeds evidence. So that either you have to participate in a rigorous trial to get some of the money, or you have to adopt a proven after school program, if there are any, uh, and implement it faithfully in your school district. What that would do over time is take a program which is now mediocre or worse 21st century program and build in a dynamic for evidence-driven <coughs> improvement. You'd grow the number of proven strategies and then you'd have a, a mechanism, the grant-making criteria, to, um, to expand those throughout the program. Um, that, that's a way forward. I think it's a way where there's room for bipartisan agreement. That Congress, it, it would, and it would get Congress and the politics a little bit out of the game. It would basically be up to uh, the reviewers and the agencies um, to decide what, uh, you know, is there a good randomized trial or not, um, that, that kind of thing. I mean, I, you know, I agree with that, of course, of course. I think we've got to do that. I, I think it's also important just to reflect on the fact that the way the funding for particular activities occurs drives a lot of this in, in, in very important ways. Um, if, if you are a program that is dependent on, on government appropriations and so on, and you've got a constituency and so forth, then the kind of dynamics that we mentioned occur. Also, you're not particularly in favor of evaluation if you're going to be funded anyway. <laughs> and we've already, you've already kind of mentioned that. I think that's true uh, to some extent in the, in the philanthropy world as well. Philanthropists like good pictures. They like smiling children, to put it crudely, and so on. And a lot of them are less concerned with the detailed evaluation than the imagery. That's certainly true, I think, a lot of corporate foundations, for example. So if, we, if, you know, if it looks good, people like it, then why look at the numbers? And then, as I said, I think when you look at that, if you contrast that with, with uh, the FDA, as uh, John was talking about, it's a very different reward system for evaluation. If you look also at, at programs that are primarily funded by the satisfaction of the customer in some way, you get a different dynamic. If you look at, at, at say, charter schools in, in, here in DC, where almost 50% of kids are in public charter schools, then the way money drives change and, 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 and looks at evaluation uh, is contingent upon the customer, the parent, being satisfied in something. What do you see? You actually see um, 
charter schools going out of business and other ones coming online. And you see attempts, constant sort of attempts to evaluate in different ways and competing forms of evaluation. I think that's important to understand. And just a final point I'll just say about the about uh, government evaluation is that one of the things one always comes across is, is disputes about what counts as the appropriate form of evaluation. What are we measuring and what is the purpose? Mm -hmm. Think about the debate over early childhood education right now. Part of the debate there is, are we measuring or should we measure the impact over the next two or three years, the first couple of years of K, you know, K through one or two, where the numbers don't look really good. Now, Jim Heckman comes along and says, well, no, no, that's not what we should be measuring at all. We should be measuring uh, what is the impact in much broader terms of these kids when they're teenagers, do they get into the juvenile justice system, how do they do, do they get into college? So there can be disputes, a lot of disputes <coughs> about evaluation based not on technical arguments, but on <coughs> what is the purpose of the program. And I think that's very important to kind of understand in terms of the resistance very often to evaluation. You think about resistance that you see among teachers to evaluate, they just say, look, we're not being evaluated for the right thing. So the FT will come along and say, we're totally against this. And it's not just strictly because it's a union. It's because they are genuinely concerned about what is actually being evaluated and whether it really is a true measurement of what is valuable about the um, input of a teacher in this case. David, you had a question, and if we have one more, we'll have them. Uh, David Kreutzer at the Heritage Foundation. I, I found the whole panel very interesting, in particular John's distinction that, that Stuart picked up on between the FDA uh, success at, at weeding out the 90% the, you know, failures. Um, and Stuart, I think you, you really hit it right, what are the incentives, but I think there, there's one incentive problem that I don't know how you overcome, I hope you have some sort of solution, <laughs> and that is politicians want to provide solutions that people want to believe. We have over and over evidence that federal job training programs are terrible. Yet, people want to believe that the reason inner-city youth are unemployed is they don't know how to use a caulking gun. So, how, you know, you, it doesn't matter how many evaluation studies you do, people want to believe these things and they keep wanting to believe them, that minimum wages will make them richer and so on. So what, what kind of a solution do we have to that? You know, politicians want to give solutions that people want to believe. Well, you need people like David and John to weigh in on exactly uh, what you know, those issues, I mean, I really think, obviously from a political point of view, you're absolutely correct. And you also have a subtext of that, that the more money you spend on something shows how much you care about it. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the result, and that is absolutely a, a factor. And anybody who talks about spending less obviously doesn't like the recipient. So if you're a conservative politician, you say, well, maybe this doesn't work. Well, then you're against poor people. So it's really easy to just slide into this, you know. Um, and, and I think... The politician can still say, like in the after school example or job training example, yes, and I voted for a billion dollars for whatever, and I love job training, and I think it's a great thing, at this, and it's totally consistent with uh, a program that has been enacted uh, and is funding job training programs, but also builds in those evidence criteria in determining who gets the grants and who doesn't. That, I think, is a way that could be politically feasible. Do we have another question from the audience? David, do you have any summary remarks or any of your guests? Uh, I'm just uh, I'm very grateful for the particip participation today. Uh, I think we have a group of uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, not including myself, who <laughs> came today and gave, gave some very good comments. And, and we have uh, a couple of books available, yours yes, and yes. Peter's, in yes. the lobby, for those that want to know more. Otherwise, thank you all for your kind attention, and let's give our, audience, our, our guests a hand.